said to me, remind my people this morning that the kingdom of God is developing in them. As they spend time with me, as you spend time with God, God is developing that power, that kingdom, that influence within your hearts. Amen. And that's why the enemy keeps our lives so kind of riled up and disorganized. And so remember Saturday, well, the, the world, or excuse me, the Jewish nation would call Saturday the Sabbath, wouldn't they? Now, we believe in a Sabbath. His name is Jesus and not a day anymore. But we honor that Sabbath because God in all his wisdom, what has he done with the Saturday? He told them the rest, didn't he? And rest for what? The first day of the week, Resurrection Sunday. Ha, ha, ha. Thought I'd throw that out. But think about it. It's a day of being with God, preparing and preparing, you know, and kind of getting ready for what God wants to do when we meet with him. Say amen. And so... Church is just like that. We come and we meet with God. We want to receive from the Lord. We want to worship. We want to give him our best gifts. And, you know, there's an exchange going on, a marketplace of life. We begin to thrive. And as consistent, the more consistent we become, the more the kingdom of God develops in us. That's why, that's why the enemy always tries to keep, keep us wrestling or be frustrated about this. And that's why prayer said, Prayer focuses us on God, and then Isaiah 26, 3, I think it is, says he will keep us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed on him. And prayer helps us stay our mind on him. Can you say amen? Are you ready for the lesson? All right, so Father, anoint the lesson. Help us to receive it on good ground. Download it into our spirit. Help us to understand that we don't want to be wayside listeners that we're easily distracted. We don't want to be thorny ground listeners where, Lord God, the roots don't go down deep and our consistency is not there. We want to be not the kind of listener that has all kinds of distractions and thornies. Those are the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things. Enter into the word and choke it. So, Lord, we want to be on good ground. So help us to be good listeners. Help us in the spirit to receive what you want to say to us today. And, Lord, thank you for the revelation knowledge of your spirit. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? All right. So we're doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. And this one is called Concerning the Coming of the Lord. There's so much confusion about God's coming. What is it? Is it the rapture? Is it him, his second coming? We're his second advent. What is it? Well, listen, it isn't that confusing. People and the enemy has made it confusing. So we're going to show you exactly and give you some major points on what to be keyed in on in these last days. There's all kinds of prophecies, all kinds of what ifs, and that could be. But God doesn't want us to be on that kind of revelation. He wants us to be settled in on the word to know the will of the Father. Can you say amen? And to understand the times and the seasons in which we live. So let's go to our paragraph as they get it up. I've been enjoying this grape juice. John chapter 14 Jesus is speaking, and he said, let, no, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Now, he's talking to his disciples, but us also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Wow. You got a place up there. And... If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Put a little underline there if you haven't already. And receive you to myself. That isn't coming down and being with us. That's receiving us up unto himself. Note that. Okay? Because there's a very powerful difference between the second coming of the Lord and the rapture. But all of it's called the coming of the Lord. Okay, so why don't you catch that? And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Who's our way? Jesus. Who's the truth? Jesus. Who's the life? Jesus. So our focus is in on Christ. And Jesus said, if you will get to know me, you will know the Father. Didn't he say that to Philip? And then 
verse 5 says this. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And how can we know the way? Of course, every one of us here would tell him. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now listen to this next phrase. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now where is the Father? He's in heaven. No one will leave this planet unless you come through Jesus. So the message is very plain. In these last days, you must have Jesus in your heart and the forgiveness of your sin. Why? You have to have the seed and the mark for God to take you. Now, what about a, a, an established holy life and living without sin and all that? That's how far you go with Christ. That's according to your walk with Christ, how much you get cleaned up and prepared. But if you accepted Jesus, now this is going to be tough for some of you to accept. If you accepted Jesus in your heart and repented from your sins and you have Jesus has never left you. He's still there. Now, the problem is, is some people bury Jesus with all the other things, the cares of his life, the deceitfulness of other things and riches. And they bury up in the flesh the seed of Christ. But nevertheless, the seed of Christ is still in them. He doesn't leave. So that means... Are they saved, once saved, always saved? Well, I'm not quite saying that. What I'm saying is, it's real hard for Satan to get the seed of Christ out of your spirit once you've brought them in. You might not live for the Lord any rest of your days, but God will consider your life and see if your name has reappeared in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, folks, when we... We're placed in the Lamb's Book of Life. By the way, if you don't know what that is, you need to look it up. We were placed in that Lamb's Book of Life in Adam before the foundation of that world. Every name that's a human being was named in that book. Now, when that child or that person was born, they would grow up into the decision of making it themselves whether they accept Jesus or not. Then when they accept Jesus, Jesus' blood goes right down over the book and removes the sin that blotted out their name, and their name reappears. But their names were written, and your names were written, in the Lamb's Book of Life before the creation of the heavens and the earth. You were the star creation. And see, that's what people get. We were, we're not the only creation of God. Well, naturally... But you're the only one in his image and after his likeness. So now you know why Jesus felt so bad and wanted to come and get us when he lost his children. Are you getting it? Show us the way, Thomas said. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I want to say blessings to you this morning. Although the phrase coming of the Lord covers a couple of areas, so let me point that out. Now, people are arguing where, whether or not we're going to go into rapture. Don't get involved in it, okay? Or what the second coming is. Everyone say coming of the Lord is two things. It's the rapture and the touching down of Jesus and setting up a little millennium. That is called the coming of the Lord because it's in different phases. Can you say amen? Plus, there are a lot of people that are the actors within the coming of the Lord. There's the condition of the world, perilous times. God has told us to keep our eyes off the world, off of others for information and patterning our walk after people and off of ourselves because we can get depressed <laughs> or we can get so full of ourselves, people don't like us. You know, I get accused of that all the time. This is confidence. I know how things are supposed to go. Just do them. Amen. I mean, if you know to pray and you don't pray, it's sin, it says. Hello. So do what God has required you to do, and he'll help you to do it. And that's all he's required us of us. The rest, he shields and protects us. Can you say amen? So the coming of the Lord. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but let me explain. The rapture, we're received up. The coming, Jesus comes down and touches the earth. 
So we'll go into that in detail. We're going to cover four areas. If you're taking notes, number one, the rapture and the second coming will define them. We'll make them simple. And then we'll show you where our focus is to be. Two, we are the salt and the light of the earth. Now, he didn't say Jesus was. He says that we are. But we have who? We have God in us. We have Jesus in us. Third thing we'll cover is the alternative to Christ. Not a good alternative. Just going to read a couple of scriptures on that. I got the up, so excuse me for a minute. And then fourthly, how to have a restful, full life as a believer. Now, God said it's ours. But I see so many people just not doing what God's asked them to do. And they're working really hard at it. And then if you, if you bother to step in and say, can I give you a few pointers? They want to bite your head off because they got it together. They got it together. Your lives are barely surfaced. Come on now. Learn, learn, grow, grow. We got almighty God has designed things. Let's learn to do it his way. Say amen. Now, I know you can laugh with me a bit. Can you say amen? All right. Learn to have that restful, full life that God promised you as a believer. All right, point one, the rapture and the second coming. Go with me to the rapture first. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians, just one, chapter 4, verse 15 through 18. You guys know this scripture. But again, people get away from things and they forget. Don't forget this. You have Jesus in your heart and you've been marked and sealed. That means when the rapture comes, you will be quickened and zap right up. Well, oh, and we showed you a clip of that, didn't we? We're going to keep showing a clip because the church has gotten away from the basics of Christ. And they're sort of, I don't know what they're doing. And Jesus called it, it's kind of like a sheep with no shepherd. Come return to the shepherd and bishop of your soul. He's overseeing you. All right. Okay, so it says right there in verse 15. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, say that's me, and remain until the coming of the Lord. Now remember, that's the phrase, two things are going on. Will by no means go before those who are asleep. That phrase means who already died and their spirit and soul are in heaven. You see, my mom and my dad are in heaven. But they're waiting for their body to be resurrected. They're there whole and complete. Maybe you have parents or people there that they're yours. We won't go before them because here's how that happens. Most of the time, not all the time, the body's either been buried six feet or blown to kingdom come or been fried. But see, that's just the body. God's going to remake all the molecules. Every molecule that makes up your body is numbered. And when the rapture comes, he's promised you a new resurrected body, just like Jesus's. So you've got to really focus on how was Jesus's death and resurrection. He walked through walls, traveled at the speed of thought, and he ate. He laughed. This is who you're going, your body's going to be. But God says, I'm going to resurrect those that died their bodies to meet us who were alive at the same time in the year to be with Christ. Woo! -hoo! Now, I always say this. The reason why the dead in Christ shall rise first, Peggy gets a kick out of this, is they're six feet lower than the rest of us on top of the ground. Come on, laugh with me. Hello? And we'll right on up. Glory to God. Now, Mike Warnke used to say, and this is not scriptural, but he used to say, I'll get a sinner in each hand. And when we go, I'll say, do you get saved or do you let it go? And you can laugh. You guys need to lighten up a bit. Amen. Look what it rest of it says. For the Lord shall descend. Okay. Himself will descend from heaven with a shout. Ba -ba! And we're gone. With the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. Why is the archangel? Well, he's splitting the devil and all his group out of the sky and casting them down while we're going up. 
the cheapest of all the archangels. You can guess whatever that name is. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. I believe we're not going to be caught up. Well, I don't know about you. You're probably going to get surprised. Caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Not on the ground. Okay? And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another. People right now are telling you there's no rapture. I found seven of them in the Bible. First Enoch, then Elijah, then Jesus, then the church. We'll be going up shortly. Then the mid-tribulation company, then the 144,000, and then finally the two squirrely witnesses, Elijah and Enoch, will be resurrected up. Remember those prophets that called on fire? Man, the Bible is not that hard. Keep the things simple, and the main things, the plain things. Say amen. Why? Because you won't be able to win somebody to the Lord with philosophy and Judaism. Moving right along. Now look, church, the rapture is the catching away of God's church, his body. We're connected to Jesus. The true born-again believers in Christ. Now God knows who those are. Let us not judge who he is and who isn't. Two, this is the first phase of the Lord's coming. The world will slip back into a tribulation for seven years. Why? This is a judgment of the world's rejection of Jesus Christ, God's son, and how they treated Jews and how they treated Christians. So it's a stupid thing to say that God will put his children to suffer with the people that rejected God. How dumb. I tell you what, because they don't know their God as good as they think they do. Don't teach stuff like that. That's not correct. God is not going to share you with a boogaloo. You do that on your own. Can you say amen? I've got this fired up. Now listen. The thing about this, point three, is this is a payback to the devil and the world's rejection of Christ. Did you know that? The tribulation, that's all it's for. Seven years of hell on earth. You said, well, we already got kind of that now. Well, it's getting better, and you better keep on praying. We got an election coming, and you know who needs to be in. Fourthly, this means we are to get ready for this coming, every day be ready. Meet with God. Your pastor, Linda, Pastor Carrie, we've been telling you to meet with God first thing every morning so that you are ready. So that you do grow and you have no excuse. God's working mightily in your life. Now stay consistent and get with the program. Don't let your always keep you from choice. You get up and come to Jesus and get healed. Come on. You come to Jesus and get healed. Now, the second coming of Jesus is when Jesus touches the ground, and he touches the ground on the Mount of Olives. And we showed you a picture of that. You can Google it. You look at the Mount of Olives, and it looks right across to the eastern gate where it's been sealed off by those demons that thought that they could keep Jesus from coming into the eastern gate. <laughs> and Jesus is going to touch down right on the Mount of Olives where he did a lot of his sermons, and it's going to crack wide open and a gushing river that's been, one of the rivers has been hit out is going to come out and cleanse the land. But before that, Jesus, when he comes, he's going to come like lightning, as is the east to west. Now, folks, every eye will see him. So let's go ahead and look at the difference between the rapture and the second coming. Amen? All right, so let's look at the scripture backing the second coming, and then I'll cover it for you. Matthew 24, just a piece, 26 through 31. Therefore, they said, they will say to you, look, he's out in the desert. Do not go out. Do not look, because he's not in the inner rooms either. But do not believe them. Whereas the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, verse 27, 
and also so the coming of the Son of Man be. For whenever the carcass is, the eagles will be gathered together. That's Armageddon. The carcasses will be all the Antichrist and his armies. There'll probably be men, millions, tens of millions of them. Just China alone has tens of millions. Do you understand? So it's going to be a great big, huge war. But guess what? We're not going to be here during that. This is at the end of the tribulation when Jesus sits down and splits the rocks, kills the Antichrist and his army, binds them up. Hello? And the blood will rise as high as horses' bridles. And then he will set up a thousand-year millennial reign that he will reign and rule. And you and I, remember, we come with Jesus when he does this. We're riding with him. Read the scripture. And when he opens his mouth and consumes the Antichrist and his armies, we'll, he'll set up his kingdom. And guess what? A lot of Christians don't know this, but God will be using his faithful Christians to teach the people that made it somehow through the tribulation. There will be natural people that will have survived. And they will be looking for help and help. And guess who's going to be helping Jesus reign and rule over the earth? Yes, you got to read the Bible says that we will rule cities and kingdoms under Jesus Christ's rule. Did you know that? Well, you do now. So that's why God says, stop fooling around. I've got some real serious work after all of this for you. But you're only going to get what you're worthy of getting by your faithful inconsistency. You know, you have to be consistent. How many know that? You're going to be good at anything. You have to be consistent with it. Come on, smile up at me. Well, your Christianity is, is not any less. There's more. So we can just see immediately. Now, verse, I love this. Verse 29. Remember, this is at the end of the tribulation. We're still talking about rapture, second coming. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's when Jesus steps in and every eye will see him. Because it's dark. If it was all dark in here and I lit a lighter, you would all see it. Well, he's going to come crashing into this earth in a millennial rain like fire. And that's your king. And we're going to be riding with him. But that's not the rapture. That's the second coming millennial rule after the tribulation. So let's get into this a little more. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the ones from the other, as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. Okay, another scripture I want to give you just so that you know. We are the salt and the earth. So, second point. We know now, so let me explain. The rapture, not every eye will see Jesus. Second coming, every eye will see him. In the rapture, we go up. We are void of experiencing the tribulation that's a judgment upon the earth. Okay, remember, seven-year tribulation is the rejection of Christ, the rejection of the Jews, and rejection of the Christian. It's a worldly punishment. And God doesn't punish his children with the world. So he takes us out. That's a rapture. Not every eye see him. He doesn't touch the ground. We're caught up in the air. Can you say amen? <laughs> then at the end of the tribulation... We have been training for seven years with King Jesus, learning all the ins and outs of being spiritual. We're going to ride back with him, and we're for a thousand years, we're going to teach the humans in the earth. Now, you should be focused and excited about that. The only thing you should be concerned about is that you're faithful enough to rule with Christ and not just be another subject. How do I do that, Pastor Kerry? faithfulness, consistency, you be there with God all the time. God first, God focused, you have to do that. And remember, 
You can't even do that on your own without God helping you. So get serious, get after God, watch the wonderful changes that happen. Now, do you believe God is way ahead of the devil? So who do you think is watching over you and protecting you? So why are we so concerned of what the devil's going to do? You just need to pray, submit to God, shield yourself. Remember, we dwell in a tank. Everyone say, I dwell in a tank. Now, have you ever seen a military tank? Well, the ones now. And all the equipment and everything like that. Okay, so let me paint the picture just because we have a, a new sister once a year. I want to give her the tank revelation. We're in a tank. His name is Jesus. We're surrounded by God. We have all kinds of spiritual equipment, weaponry, and everything. Can you say amen? Now, the devil has been stripped. Jesus stripped him over 2,000 years ago. All he has is deceit, a bullhorn, and a squirt gun. Now, he's outside the tank, and he's yelling at you. And he's always reminding us about our past. And if we buy into his lies, he'll con us to get out of our tank and walk out into the open so he can squid us with corruption and pollution of the world. So stay in the tank. Stay with Jesus. Stay dedicated. God will break you through every problem that you're facing. He'll break you through in such victory. Just remember you're in the tank. Don't get nervous. Get out of the tank. Don't get frustrated with the tank. It kicks the tires. Stop being such a foolish person. Think you can do it yourself. Stay in the tank. Use the equipment and love God. Say amen. Woo! So many Christians think they have to do the battle. The battle's been won. Why are we still battling? Now, so you have to go to God with that truth because it's an important truth. You go, why am I still battling if you already won? And don't listen to your head because it will tell you every excuse. You listen to God and he'll tell you because there's still more of you trying to live for me and it'd be a lot more of you dying for me so I can live through you. Say amen and everybody. That's key truth. It's the key truth. And I, I worked hard to get God to show me that truth. Because listen, God has got it so covered if you think about it. Just go through all the provisions. Stay away. No, listen. Stay away from the Old Testament for a time until you get to know your covenant. Now, I'm not against the Old Testament. I, I'm, I'm really good at it. But unless you know Jesus and your equipment... The enemy can use some of the Old Testament examples and failures and stuff to play games with your head. If you don't believe me, read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It will warn you about the New Testament, the Old Testament, about how that they didn't know a father. They only knew a fearful God that might destroy them at any time. So when you study all that wonderful stuff, and believe me, it's all wonderful, you must have a handle on who you are in Christ and what the truth is, so that when you look at those stories, you can pull Jesus out of them. Hello? Because the New Testament's hidden in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament's revealed in the New Testament. So get with the new for a while until you understand all the workings, ask a lot of questions. You still can look at the Old Testament, but don't spend days studying it. It's over with. That's why it's old. <laughs> Duh. Now, don't get me wrong. Everybody reads me wrong. I love it. But unless you understand your covenant, Satan will have a heyday with you. You won't be able to discipline your mouth. You won't be able to pray and believe in faith, right? You'll fall from a type of grace. Grace, why? Because it gets us back into works. If you try hard enough, pray hard enough, I did not get it then. And God says, that's a work. I don't want your works. I want your heart. I want you with me so I can bring it out of you. I don't want you to try to bring it out of you yourself because it's really not good. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. You all know I'm right. But I, I only write because Jesus is right. 
Not because I know more than everybody else. I do not. Point two, we are the salt and the light of the world. So let's get the, the depth of this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 13. Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. Now, most of you know what salt's good for. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. But if the salt loses its saltiness, because salt can actually lose its saltiness, it doesn't have the effect. That's what Satan wants to do to us. Help us lose our saltiness. Lose it in confusion and not understanding. Hello? It'd be kind of like taking a tour and the guide has never done it before. <laughs> Moving right along. But the salt loses its flavor. How shall it be seasoned? In other words, you're to remain salty with the word and the love of God so that God can salt you. You're the salt shaker. God is the shaker. And if you don't have much saltiness, he's not going to shake you out much. Because you're going to go around and complain and say, I got this problem and everything. People say, I don't want that, Jesus. Do you understand? Yes, we have problems. Yes, there are things. But God's working those out. Can you say amen? And on the way to that, keep your saltiness. How do I do that? Well, we've told you. Meet with God first thing with God every morning. You have a routine maybe to get ready for work? Get up a little 15 minutes early. Grab your coffee. Your hair is masked. You drool all over your face and say, God, I present myself to you. Cleanse me, wash me, set me up. Change me in the heart, Lord God, as I worship. Then just keep on going through your routine. Remember, it's all by invitation that God acts. If you never invite him to do stuff, he'll only do what you will open yourself up for him to do. And we only grow as much as we allow him to grow us up. Say amen. Boy, this is good. I don't think I can win any friends, though. Amen. So, it says this. It is good for nothing to be thrown and, and trampled underfoot of men. God showed me one time, he says, when a Christian loses their testimony, they give up on God, the whole world hates them. You're not going to get any friends that way. They're going to hate you anyway because you had God at one time and then you went and turned your back on them. That's what it says. It says a branch that doesn't bear fruit, people throw it into the fire. They reject it. God says, you're going to either live for me or you're going to live a life of hell and rejection. And I don't know about you, God got tired of that. And you did too. That's why you're saved. We're not like that dog that returns to our vomit or that pig wallowing in the mire or the clay. We are a child of the living king. And God is helping us every day to thrive and to live Focus on the right things. Say amen. And the struggles that we, we fight, the struggles that we encounter are a challenge for God in you to put you over. They're not there to shut you down only. The enemy throws things at you. But remember, he's got a squirt gun, a bullhorn, and you're in a tank. Don't lose sight of who you are. And that's how the enemy gets us. He gets us to focus on all the wrong things. We lose sight for a, child, for a moment of who we are, and then we go on some kind of journey that God didn't let us. And he sees the sheep. Oh, there's Carrie. He's wandering. What's he doing over there? Come on now. Believe me, God has such great things for you, more than we can even imagine. He said before we can imagine or think. Wow, that's good. All right, let's go on and read. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket or under a lampstand so that it gives light to all those that come into the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, good works, God works, and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, we're salt, we're light. What does salt do? It melts snow. It adds flavor. It preserves meat. It stings in an open wound. 
it causes it when turned into a powder, it causes flame and flame throwing. It blows up. Salt is an amazing thing. And back in the day of Jesus, it was worth more than money at times. You are worth more than any money. You have the ability to melt cold hearts, the ability to add season to people's lives, the ability to help flames to rise up. Why? Because you are the salt of the earth and the salty one lives in you. Now, if you're so distracted, you can't bring Jesus out. Folks, moms, dads, grandpas, grandmas, people in your family need to see you've changed. You, you recommitted to God. You said, Lord, I'm yours. But they need to see you are changed before they can even be touched. That's why a prophet or a preacher is not welcome in their own household because they know mom before they were saved. When mom was backslidden, when, when dad was that way, you see. So what we want to do is we want to let God change us so dramatically that we don't say anything to our family. Their family says something to us. Should be our goal. Now, we do say things to our family. We do correct our children. But listen, look at the results. Children pattern their self after their father or mother, whether they admit it or not. And if they see you loose living and japping, duping, being a hypocrite, stuff like that, then they're not going to be very, very dedicated to want to get saved. But if you are dedicated, which I believe all of you are, then your children are going to be touched because God promises to save all of your household and really deal with their dreams, their visions, their, their, even their friends. And you can pray properly, God screen my children's friends. Keep the riffraff out of there. In Jesus' name, can you say amen? Are you getting blessed today? I hope to feed you with some good, good spiritual food, and then we're going to give you some nachos afterwards. Feed you burpee and send you home. Okay. I'm going to laugh with me. So listen, church, we are the salt of the earth. Salt is like money. To God, you're worth a whole lot. And then when we, when we don't care anymore, when the enemy convinces us to give up or try to quit and everything, it hurts God's heart because he went through so much to get us, to redeem us back. Two, salt has wonderful properties. We already covered them. Thirdly, what can salt do? What is it used for? You will be used of God the more salty you become. Let your conversation be with salt Excuse me, be with grace seasoned with salt. We are the light of the world. A city set on a hill. People need to see there's a God. How are they going to see if they don't see God in you? They see you emotionally upset and you can't control your lips. And, and they're looking at that and going, where's God in all this? Really, people are looking for God. And, you know, the church, has, and I'm not picking on too much. I have to be careful. The church has not displayed God like they should be in the last 20 years. It's time for all of us to get back to Jesus, back to serving God, back to living for Christ, make the gospel simple again so all people can see the city on a hill and they can march for them, march towards that city because it's a city of refuge. It's a place where I can hear about God. See, you are a city set on a hill. God will not set you on a hill if you are a complainer and you're, you attack people in authority. You will stay in the garbage bin. Just said that no extra charge for that. It's the truth. Don't be a mouth. Don't back talk. Don't disrespect people because you will eat the garbage. Because as you sow, you reap. So we just want God to get all that out of us. Say amen. All right, let's go to our third part, uh, third point. The alternative to Christ. Now you can imagine that already. Just going to take you to some scripture. Read it rather quickly. Only make a few points because I don't want to hang on the negative. Everyone can see what's going on. Two kingdoms are working. Kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. God is passive aggressive and Satan is aggressive 
and then becomes passive when God shows up. What do you mean by that? God does not force himself on anyone. He waits to be invited. But I'll tell you this. If the devil starts picking on any of his kids, God is aggressive. Say amen. amen. So be passive. Give grace. Be merciful. But stand for what you believe. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. All right. Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 through 12. And we'll read it quickly, okay? Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord. Now, we co covered it. Rapture, second coming of Christ. Of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ has already come. Now, the seven day Adventists believe we're already in the tribulation. Stay away from them. They're so confused. They'll make you stop eating meat. And you have to start to be a vegetarian. And these are things warned about in scripture. Abstaining from meats. Telling you you can't eat certain meats. And, and never get married. This is some of the evil spirit's doings. Look at the nuns and the priests of the Catholic Church. Well, you're mentioning a name. Well, come on. And you know what? Those poor ladies needed a husband. And they turned into perverts, a lot of them. Had children without marriage vows. How does that work? When the devil tells you to do something, you can't stop doing. You go to Christ. You don't try to work it out yourself. Say amen. And religion really is a puke to God. He does not like religion. You're not a religious person. You know God personally. Make sure when people think to put you in the religious category, say, I'm sorry, I don't yell to Jesus, crucify him. I'm not religious. I don't have my own club. I have a walk with God. Say amen. You get it? That's what you have. It's a personal walk with God like the rest of us have. The reason why I, there's no membership here, we don't have all of these dynamic things and all that to sign you up and get you going, because God never requires that of us. Didn't tell me to do it. Now, other people, yes, he, there's a way to keep track of people, make sure you follow up on them. But our job isn't to look at numbers. Our job is to make sure our walk is right and we win souls and touch lives. Say amen. Listen to what this says. Not be soon shaken in mind, either by spirit or letter, as Christ has already come. Let no one deceive you. There it is again. By any means, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away first. Now, folks, the word falling away means people will lose interest in God. I'm not going to harp on this, but I'll tell you why. Because Christians aren't living Christ. They're acting like the world. I mean, I heard of a one place where these Christians went up. They were camping up there in Crystal Mountain. Some guy was thinking of suicide. They went over with beer in their hands and joints, and they tried to tell them about Jesus. Come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you. The idea is they got to see some difference. Well, do, 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 Jesus still loves him, yeah, but that man didn't want anything to do with that Jesus. How we represent as an ambassador of Christ is very important. Don't go to your family parties and walk around with a beer in your hand and act like an idiot and then try to witness. Boo! And that's half of the church right now. Not in, not, not in the world, in the United States. They're compromised. They're partiers. And guess what? They're going to go. They got, if they have Jesus in their heart, they're going to go. But when they go, they won't have much rewards at all. Just a chewing out session. Because we all stand before Jesus and give account what we have done as a Christian. Whether good or whether bad. That's pretty heavy. When I found that, up, found that out, I kind of went, oh, Lord. And he says, I'm trying to tell my children that, that we, there's not much time left. 
You can't live like you used to live as a Christian. It's not going to work today. You can't live a compromised life. All right, so let's go on. Okay, don't let anybody deceive you into being a compromise. And then it says, look, it tells us that day will not come unless there's a falling away comes first. And then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Now, let me clarify. We're gone by this time. We're not in the earth. God has raptured us. And when we're raptured, we go up, Satan shows up. When he who's withholding goes, there's no withholding the church of Jesus Christ. And then the devil comes in and the earth falls into a seven-year tribulation. Say amen. That's the way it's going to be set up. Well, we're not going to be there. Are you planning to leave? How many are you going to take with you? And the son of perdition, the Antichrist, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God, and it is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is called the abomination of desolation. Happens midway through the tribulation, where the little Antichrist comes into the temple and declares himself to be God. Then all hell breaks loose. That's the last three and a year, half years of the tribulation. Now, if you would like to know more, I have some marvelous teachings and outlines on that subject matter that are just clear and, and just nice so the child of God that is searching can understand the phases of God's coming. Can you say amen? And then drop down to verse 5, same chapter. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining. That's the church. That he may be revealed in his own time, the Antichrist. For the mystery of in lawlessness or iniquity is already working in the earth. And only he who will restrain will restrain it until be, he be taken out of the way. Hello? That's not the Holy Spirit. That's the church. We're the ones holding back the devil. Oh, come on. It, it looks like we're not doing a very good job. You said it. I didn't. We've forgotten our first love. We don't know how to stand and fight properly. We're whacking and, and shouting and bumping around like somebody beat in the air when you can whisper the name of Jesus and crack his noggin right open. Learn to do it Jesus' way. And that's why I'm here to teach you if you will want to learn. Because it's really pretty easy if you let the Holy Spirit guide you. Say amen. All right, verse 22. And look, we're going to go to, uh, I, I'm sorry, verse 10. And all unrighteousness and deception among those who are perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. People are going to reject God. They're not going to get saved. Share with everybody you meet. And there's some are going to tell you no, but you keep on sharing because there's going to be people saying yes. Say Amen. So it says that they all may be condemned when they believe a lie. So that's the alternative. You either walk with Christ or you're going to believe a lie out there somewhere. Romans 1 tells us a little bit farther. But before we read Romans 1, 18 through 25, church, the born again believers, God has living or God is living on the inside of us. So we don't have to be concerned if we meet with God the way we're supposed to. Two, we are to seek him each day first, establishing a strong prayer life, purposeful walk, and a place of yielding and listening to God. And that's what we should be developing, not trying to get all our needs met. You start developing so that you understand how needs are met, and God will bring your needs being met. Just go win souls, touch lives, and do your best. And God will begin to show and educate you. Remember, he's developing the kingdom in us as we expose ourselves to him. So it's developing. You might not think it's as far ahead as you'd like it to be, but it is. And you've got to learn to 
Let the tank carry you. Let Jesus guide you. Use his weaponry and you enjoy the kingdom. Now, I'll share more with you about that. Can't wait till next week. I got some wonderful revelations for you, but let's go on. Now, if you ever want to find out exactly what happens in the last days and why people are as bad as some become, Romans 1 tells us in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. Because what they known of God, see, everybody, every human being knows there's a God, no matter what they say, is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Every human being knows there's a God, no matter what they say. Verse 20 says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made. Everything God made shows of his life even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without an excuse. People either accept Christ or they have no excuse because they know there's a God. Get that. Get that. God is never unfair about anything. They are without excuse. Because though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful and became fruitful in their own imaginations, and their foolish hearts became darkened, and professing themselves to be wise, they become fools and change the glory of the incorruptible God into something like an image of something that's created, sticks, stones, birds, Reptiles worship the sun, the moon, the stars. Hello? Anything that's created rather than the creator itself. Satan's job, Satan's work to get people to do that. Look at what God does. And change the glory of the incorruptible God to birds, four-footed beasts, and animals and creeping things. And God turned them over to their own reprobate mind. 1 John chapter 5 tells us how to be. Everyone say, okay, finally I'm going to release you. 1 John 5, this is one of my favorite scriptures, BJ. It says, we know that whoever's born of God does not sin. <laughs> now listen, it's very simple to understand this. Don't make it hard. Who lives in your spirit? Jesus. Just say Jesus, that's fine. Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Come on, make it simple. Jesus, let me just, can Jesus sin? No. So your spirit, God's spirit, became one when you said, Jesus, come in my heart, forgive me my sin. Jesus came into your heart, into your spirit, and you became a new creature in your spirit person, spirit man. Your head needs to be fixed, and your body needs to be crucified. Say, I got it? Now, God in you cannot make a mistake. That's why Paul says, be led of the spirit. Why? The spirit comes out of your core, not your head. Get up in the morning, say, Lord, I'm laying out my entire day to you. You know what I need to do. You know what needs to come. So I'm asking you, guide me right on through it. Give me the grace and praise and love as you develop me inside. You see the focus? Can you feel the Holy Spirit? The focus is not on the distractions. This is the end time distraction time. But on God, getting it together, making your steps count. And it is absolutely, tremendously fun. Linda and I have had the time of our life. Oh, yeah, we've gone through hell and back and challenges. But we know God remains the same. And we stay consistent with him. He remains to keep his promises. We become in a tank with weaponry that we just fire in the name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, the devil's working on my son, trying to make him into this. I release Jesus. I send you into my son and deal with him every day until he dies about his life, his health, and Christ Jesus. Now, can you pray simply like that? You didn't get out of the tank. You didn't whack anything. You're not screaming and yelling. You shot a bullet, a smart bullet of Jesus 
go and you put him by your invitation into his life. Don't wait for him to do it. Send God. Not enough people sending God to change the weather, sending God to change the churches, sending God to help the nurses and the doctors in the hospitals. Nobody's sending God like they should. They're sitting around trying to figure things out. Come on here. We'll teach you. Possibly that's why there's nobody here. I'm joking. I'm afraid to be taught. I might know something and be responsible. All right, let's quit messing with it. Come on, I'm going to finish up. Look at whoever is born of God does not sin. Why? Because in your spirit, man, is God and he doesn't sin. That's why we're to walk by him, not our own. We're going to make mistakes. You're going to make boo-boos. But get right up and get going. God took you as a broken package and he promises to make you whole again. Let's go on. He that's born of God does not sin, but he who has been born of God keeps himself in God. I'm adding that in God. Keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Now do you see the tank? Now you see the ability of you walking in God where Satan, all he does is yell, tempt, try to draw you away. Everyone's tempted when he's drawn away. Drawn away from what? The tank you're in. Don't get out of the tank. His name is Jesus. Stay with Jesus. God, I'm not going to go do what my friends want me to do unless I first pray to you and, and pray and ask some wisdom. Come on, stay in the tank. And then if God says, go visit your family, bring the tank. Drive right on up and take over the meeting with Jesus. We have the jurisdiction to take control in the earth. Are you taking control over your family, your children? Do it. Be encouraged. God will be right there to help you. But if we don't do it, who's doing it? We have not because. And the wicked one toucheth you not. And we know the Son of God has come and given us an understanding. We know that Jesus is true. The truth is true. And the truth, God dwells in us. This is eternal life and forgiveness of sin. God says, walk with me. I'm going to walk you out of this planet. Remember, this planet's a prison. Adam made it that way by allowing the devil access to the planet. When he disobeyed God and ate of the poison fruit, that was a poison fruit with Satan's nature, animals, DNA, satanic fallen nature of devils in that DNA, in that fruit. That's why if you look at your DNA, you got Cro-Magnon man and you got apes and everything in your DNA. How in the heck did that get in there? I'll tell you, it was in the fruit that Satan got Adam and Eve to eat, where God said, what did God say about that fruit? Don't you eat it. Now, the Hebrew and the translators, they lost the meaning of it. They thought it meant, don't you disobey God. Don't you disobey God. No, Jesus was saying, this tree with the fruit has the ability to change your DNA into your flesh being the animal that it is. And folks, you all know what your flesh did when you were drunk, when you were partying, when you were doing the things you shouldn't. Come on, don't get so sanctified. And you became animalistic. That's because you, that body is nothing more than just a little bit above the animal. So therefore, you present it to God as a reasonable, responsible Christian and ask God to keep it in the line so that when we are resurrected and raptured, this body will take on a new body, a, a glorified body. This mortal will put on immortality and death will be swallowed up in victory. Did you get something out of that this morning? Would you give the Lord praise? We are